So uh, first of all, I'd like to say, uh, refer you, if you want a written version of parts of this talk and some other parts that I couldn't include in it, uh, I did a write-up of my Turing lecture um, in the December issue of the CACM. And that is on my Stanford uh, Publications uh, page, a free PDF. Uh, thank you, C uh, ACM, for making it freely available, unlike some places. And so you can download it. Just Google Stanford Hellman Publications, and you should get the Publications page. Or if you go to my home page, there's a link to Publications. And if you want even more, uh, just underneath that CACM paper, which I think is number 78 in the publications list, there are three books listed. And the third book is a book my wife and I just completed a year and a half ago on um, the subtitle it describes it, Creating True Love at Home and Peace on the Planet, which doesn't have much to do with CS380, except a lot of the stories are in there because so much of what I've learned, uh, uh, like I'm going to tell you a story today where the devil was on my shoulder whispering in my ear, that story's in there. Uh, and you might also find the other parts interesting, especially if we want to be using public key cryptography 50 or 100, we want people to be using public key cryptography 50 or 100 years from now, the creating peace on the planet part is very important because otherwise we're not likely to be here. Um, so, um, there aren't, all, how many students are there here now? Let's see, raise your hands. Oh, more, great. Okay, I know most of you are out there on the, TV system watching this later. But um, if you're in the PhD program and if you have a moment where you think, who am I to make an original contribution to knowledge, know you're in very good company. Uh, uh, when I was doing my PhD here, 66 to 68, uh, I felt that I, I got great, made great progress in the first nine months or a year. And then I, for about six months, I was feeling, you know, I hit a brick wall. Who am I to make an original contribution to knowledge? And then half an hour later, after those six months, and within half an hour, it went from there to almost having the thesis done. And let me just do a show of hands. Those of you who have uh, done theses, how many of you had similar experiences where you, not, not necessarily half an hour, okay, but the part where you wondered, because that, that's very unusual. How many of you had the experience of wondering whether you uh, were up to doing it? And how many of you actually made it through? Yeah, same people. So remember that. The goals of this talk are uh, several fold. One is to pull back the veil on the development of public key cryptography and to see how it's, I love that people call it revolutionary and please don't stop calling it that. That makes, makes me very happy. But at the end of this talk, I hope you'll have another attitude is, why did it take them so long? There were all these road signs almost pointing them. I mean, much as uh, you, you said about, it didn't, doesn't quite go back to Plato, but uh, trap doors were known about, uh, but making them into a public key crypto system was something totally different. There are all levels of trap doors, as you'll see. So the evolutionary aspect, and also to honor some of the unsung and undersung uh, heroes. So like the ACM Turing Award was given to D Whit Diffie and me. Ralph Merkel might or might not have been included, as you'll see. Uh, he's been included on some awards and not on others. He was not included in this one, but he certainly, while it's not unsung, is undersung. And then you hear about others who you probably never have heard of. Another question, why is the talk so historical? Well, because I don't work in this area intensively anymore. I work primarily on uh, the risk of nuclear war and how to reduce it, and that's where the creating peace on the planet part comes from. And so when I have a question, I call Dan Bona or someone like him and get, get it answered. So I don't pretend to be uh, current. So was public key cryptography, let's see, here we go. Revolutionary or evolutionary? Well, in one sense, it was revolutionary. Uh, uh, in 1883, August Kirchhoffs enunciated several important principles for a good cryptographic system. They'd been around, but he codified them. And one of them was that the general system should be considered public whether or not you tried to keep it secret. So like in the military, you might have a piece of hardware that you keep secret because you don't want your, energy, your enemy using it but you still should assume it's public. Why? Because it might be captured. And it's hard to change. All of the security has to reside in the secrecy of the key. That was the important part. So how can you have a public key system? It seems to violate one of the, it seems to be going back to the dark ages. Uh, of course, we did that by separating the key into two parts, a public part and a secret part. And so all secrecy must reside, all security must reside in the secrecy of the secret key is the answer. Well, how is it evolutionary? Um, well, the 
concept, half of the concept, which is the privacy part. There's two parts. There's digital signatures, and Witt and I were the only two who came up with that. Uh, Ralph had privacy, and uh, uh, actually somewhat before us, as you'll see, even though it was a paper, paper appeared after ours. And uh, three people at GCHQ, the um, uh, British equivalent of NSA, came up with the same ideas, if we can believe what they say, and I do tend to believe what they say, but you know, how do you believe somebody 20 years after the fact when they say, well, we knew this 20 years ago, and here are our secret papers from that time. Uh, now, I don't think they would pull one on us, but uh, uh, still, there is a question of how to deal with this. Uh, so first of all, it's important to recognize, you, people often talk about Diffie-Hellman key exchange. In this talk, you'll see why I tend to call it Diffie-Hellman-Merkel key exchange. And this is a picture taken about a year or two after we came up with our results. Ralph Merkel on the left, uh, a younger me in the middle, and hairier. And with Diffie, just as hairy as today, those of you who know him, uh, on the right. Um, another evolutionary aspect of public key cryptography, and here you're really starting to see these road signs pointing us there that it took us a while to see. One thing that Witt and I did in New Directions, and as we were working on, this is our uh, paper in 1976 uh, that uh, put forth the idea of public key cryptography publicly, and had what's often called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, we, we tried to find a hierarchy of cryptographic systems, and the simplest system was a one-way function. Now, those were well known. The Unix operating system had been using one-way functions uh, for years to protect passwords. And that has a kind of trap door, as you'll see in a minute. Then there were conventional, what are sometimes today called symmetric crypto systems. That was a higher level of, of, uh, of, of entity, as you'll see in a minute, because you can always turn a conventional crypto system into a one-way function, but you can't always go in the reverse direction. The next level up is something you may not have heard of, a trapdoor crypto system. This is not a public key crypto system. It's, it's something that I'll describe in a minute. But from there to a public key crypto system, which is sometimes called an asymmetric system, was a relatively small step. And Witt and I, as you'll see, had come up with the idea of a trapdoor crypto system somewhat before we had the idea of a public key crypto system. So how do you get from the very first level a, um, I'm sorry, how do you get from the second level, which is a conventional crypto system like AES today, the Advanced Encryption Standard, to a one-way function? That's, that's showing that, the, Conventional crypto systems can always be turned into one-way functions, but the reverse is not always true. That's why they're higher in the hierarchy. Well, you put a fixed plain text. Let's see, I think I've got it here. Where is it? Maybe I don't. You've got a fixed plain text. Could just be all zeros going in the plain text port. port. I call that P naught. You put X, the input to the one-way function, in the key port, and you take Y, the output of the one-way function, out the ciphertext port. How hard is it to compute y from x? It's easy, because that's encryption, right? How hard is it to go backward from y to x to invert the one-way function? Why is that hard? Because that's cryptanalysis. OK, so you can always turn a conventional crypto system into a one-way function. Now, what is a, what are, people sometimes call public key systems trapdoor crypto systems, which is actually incorrect. Trapdoors are essential and associated with all kinds of cryptographic systems, not just uh, public key ones. In fact, I sometimes describe a trapdoor quiz problem. The students here have all, and actually all of us have experienced trapdoor quiz problems. You take the quiz, and after slaving away for an hour, the professor says, OK, uh, turn your papers in. Oh, we have two minutes left. Let me give you the answer. Uh, the answers, and I'll convince you they're right. And in two minutes, he or she does what took, you couldn't do in an hour or was very hard for you to do in an hour. Now, of course, you can understand why that is. There were many paths to get to the solution. The professor who made up the problem had a specific path in mind and went immediately to it. Well, now, a true trapdoor quiz problem could be constructed from a one-way function. What I would do is I would tell the class the one-way function, like AES that I just had on the last slide, and I would pick a random, and I tell them what P naught is, all zeros, for example. I would generate a random X that I would not tell the class. I would then compute Y from X, tell it to the class, and say, OK, now find X. You could slave away for a million years. At the end of the million years, I say, OK, paper's in. Oh, and in the few microseconds left uh, on your computer, 
put in this x and you'll see it produces y. Do you see that I could convince you of the answer? This is closely related to a very important problem in theoretical computer science, the p equals n p question, which I won't go into the details, but many of you will know what I'm talking about. Now, what's a trapdoor crypto system? A trapdoor crypto system would be a general's dream or NSA's dream or all their foreign equivalents dream. Think of a military situation. I'm in charge of an army on this side, and you guys are all in the army on the other side. I want my guys to be using a crypto system that you can't break. But if it's captured and you start using, I want to be able to break it. So if I could construct a trapdoor crypto system, one where there is secret trapdoor information built in, you know it's built in, but you don't know what the value of x is that's built into it, you can't break it. But if you start using it, I can quickly break it. And you see why that would be a general's dream. Well, trapdoor crypto systems allow public key exchange. If I can generate, we, by the way, I should emphasize, we never came up with a way to generate really good trapdoor crypto systems. But if we could, then I would generate a trapdoor crypto system, and I would know the secret information. I would not tell it to, um, let's say, to the whole, I wouldn't tell it to anybody, but I would tell you how the system works without the trapdoor information. I would then tell someone in the back of the room to please send me a message using a random key that only she knows. The message, she calls the message out to me across the room. Can I recover it? Yes, because I know the trapdoor information. I can break it. Even though I don't know her key, I can recover her key. Or I can recover the message. But the rest of you can't break it. We get privacy without any prearrangement. And so I think you can start to see the, we, this came up because we were wondering how NBS, the National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, was going to generate a data encryption standard, which they did in 1975, uh, that would let, that was secure and yet that NSA wouldn't mind having. We're going to get to that later. They would ideally like to build a trap door in so that if it's used by one of our uh, America's adversaries, NSA could break it. But you see, from that to a public key crypto system is a small step. Now, public key cryptography, let's catch up here. Witt and I developed the concept of a public key crypto system. And RSA was the first implementation of a public key crypto system. We, in our paper, we had the concept, but we didn't see how to implement it. It was one where you have a public key and a secret key, and you could use either the public key to act on data to encrypt it, and then the secret key to decrypt it. Well, in that case, I, everybody has a public key. When uh, Howie, uh, Howard Cohen over there, sorry, we went to high school together, so I remember him as Howie. Uh, he's now Howard. Uh, if he wants to send me a message, he looks up my public key, encrypts it using my public key. Can Carl recover the message? No, because he doesn't know my secret key, which is needed. But I can do that. If I want to sign a message uh, and send it to Howard, I use my secret key. To sign it, only I can do that. Howard can use my public key to um, verify it. And so can Carl, who's now a judge. Notice there's no privacy there, but you can get privacy and authentication, but I won't go into that. Uh, Ralph Merkel, working as an undergraduate at Berkeley and later as a master's student, came up independently and slightly before us with the concept of a public exchange of, informa of information securely, and I'll, have a, I'll show you his uh, proposal in just a second. And um, the interesting thing is what's often called Diffie-Hellman key exchange is actually a Merkle system. Merkle had what, he called, what we call now a public key distribution system. It was a way to distribute keys, but it couldn't actually encipher information. You then had to get the, use the key that was distributed using Merkle's method to then encrypt a message in a conventional system. Uh, whereas with public key crypto system that Witt and I had proposed, you could actually encipher the information directly. And so Diffie-Hellman is a Merkle public key distribution system, which is why I often call it Diffie-Hellman-Merkle. So Ralph took CS244 in the fall of 1974 uh, at Berkeley, uh, and uh, you had to do a term project. And he proposed two term projects. One was project number one was public key cryptography, basically, at least the privacy part of it. And I'll read it to you. Topic, establishing secure communications between separate secure sites over an insecure communication link. That's exactly 
public key cryptography. And what the professor wrote, project two, much more mundane, I didn't bother listing it, looks, uh, looks more reasonable, maybe because your description of project one is muddled terribly. Talk to me about this, about these today. What did Ralph do? He dropped the course. <laughs> and he went and did public key cryptography on his own. Unfortunately, his paper was published after ours for reasons that you'll see, even though it was submitted before ours. The CACM, which is a great journal usually, in this case made a horrible mistake. They initially rejected Ralph's paper. Um, the editor wrote, I was particularly bothered by the fact that there are no references to the literature. Has anyone else ever investigated this approach? What's the answer? No. <laughs> this was a seminal paper. It's unusual. Now, admittedly, Ralph should have had some references anyway. He was, remember, he was an undergraduate when he wrote this, maybe a just beginning master's student. He didn't know how to write a paper, and he didn't have any real support at Berkeley. Uh, one of the, 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 I think there was only one reviewer for this paper that the editor quoted, and she called him an experienced cryptography expert. And he wrote, the paper is not in the mainstream of present crypto cryptography thinking. I would not recommend that it be published. OK, so let's move on. Let me see where I am. Uh, how I'm doing here. Yeah, doing OK. Um, John Gill uh, just won emeritus in, uh, last month in electrical engineering. He came as a new assistant professor. I came in 71 on the faculty. I'd done my graduate work here 66 to 68, came back after a stint on the East Coast. And John came on a year after me. He'd done his PhD at Berkeley under Manuel Blum, who's now at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and he did it in mathematics, not computer science. So John was a much better mathematician than I. And so when I was looking for structured uh, cryptographic entities, I went to John as, to see if he had any suggestions. I started with the simplest entity, a one-way function. So I said, John, do you know any functions that are easy to compute but hard to invert? Well, the first one, or nearly the first one that he told us, I forget the conversation, was factoring. You know, it's easy to find two large primes, multiply them together, hard to factor. Instead of saying, hey, we, that's RSA, what did I say? I said, we've already thought of that, and we haven't been able to do anything with it. Uh, um, we totally missed RSA. Uh, after one or two others, he said, what about indices? And I said, what's an index? Well, he's a mathematician. We call them discrete logarithms. He calls them indices. Uh, and uh, you, discrete exponentiation, y equal alpha to the x mod q is fast. If you want to compute alpha to the ninth power, you don't have to multiply alpha times alpha times alpha eight or nine times, depending how you count it. You just square alpha three times, each of which is a multiplication, getting alpha to the eighth, multiply it by alpha to the first that you already have, and you get alpha to the ninth. In the same way, if q is a thousand bit number, you don't have to do two to the thousandth multiplications to get the result. You just have to do at most 2,000, 1,000 squarings and 1,000 multiplications depending on the binary decomposition of x. Um, and each time you're reducing mod q, so the numbers don't get bigger and bigger and bigger. They're, they stay at 1,000-bit numbers. On the other hand, computing x from y, it's the index or discrete log, is believed to be very slow, although great progress has been made. When John first suggested this to me, the best that we could see was, were methods that were exponential in the size of Q, whereas now we know sub-exponential methods. Now, the first thing I tried doing with this index or discrete log function was creating a conventional cryptographic system. And I, I'm not sure, but I think at this point we didn't even have the public key concept. If we had, we might have, seen, we might have come up with RSA, because the system I came up with was RSA except for one minor little glitch that you, uh, switch that you'll see in a minute. So I was playing around one night, and I said, OK, let's assume that, let's look at computing three different entities. You have th alpha, x, and y. If you know alpha and x, computing y is easy. That's exponentiation. If you know alpha and y, computing x is hard. It's a one-way function. And then there was a third possibility. If you know x and y, computing alpha, I won't show you how to do it, but it's easy. Well, then I said, if you're trying, I was trying to make this into a conventional cryptographic system. I said, if you know the plain text and the key, computing the ciphertext is easy, and ciphering. Second line, 
Computing the plain text from the ciphertext in the key is deciphering. That also has to be easy. But going from the plain text and the ciphertext to the key has to be hard. That's cryptanalysis under what's called a known plain text attack. And so you've got easy, hard, easy, and here you've got easy, easy, hard. What stands out? There's only one hard in both places. So K would have to be X. And so that gave me the, the solution, which is shown here. And that's Steve Polig um, a couple of years after uh, we, we came up with these results. Um, Unfortunately, Steve died just last April uh, in his um, early to mid-60s, uh, great tragedy. But that was in better times. Um, the system was, let the ciphertext be the plain text to the kth power mod q. That's an exponentiation. That's easy. Let deciphering be an exponentiation also. Take the ciphertext, raise it to the dth power mod q. Now, since, oh, I wish, to, yeah, I do have, oh, I do have it. So you substituting p to the k in here for c, you get p to the kd. So what you want is kd must equal 1, right? Well, except exponentiation in the exponent is not done mod q. It's done mod q minus 1 for reasons we won't go into. It's known as Euler's totient function. But that's easy to do. It's easy using a um, uh, generalized Euclid's algorithm to invert, to find the multiplicative inverse of k mod q minus 1. Now, compare this to RSA, those of you who know it. What's the only difference? Instead of mod Q, you do it mod N. And instead of calling the enciphering key K, they call it E. And the deciphering exponent they, is still called D. Now, the reason I think we, there are several reasons we missed it. I, you know, we just missed it. But the other thing is I think I came up with this when, before we had the idea of a public key crypto system, and they never came back to it adequately and looked at it later. So here's the RSA public key crypto system, almost the same equations, except the arith arithmetic in the exponent is now not done mod q minus 1, but it's done mod p minus 1 times q minus 1. And that's what makes it into a public key crypto system. Because now, knowing the modulus n does not tell you the factorization into p and q, so it doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you um, um, what phi of n is. You need to know the factorization of n to compute the deciphering exp exponent from the uh, enciphering exponent. Now, the polig hellman paper appeared a few months after RSA, but was submitted about a year before it. Uh, so you have to watch it just because paper, and, and just like Ralph's paper appeared after uh, Witts in my paper, but it was actually submitted before it. So there's RSA back in, uh, those of you who know Ron today, uh, he looks roughly the same, but again, just like me, older. Uh, that's Adi Shamir on the left, Ron in the middle, and Len Adelman on, on the right. Well, let me show you the, how to do the, what's often called Diffie-Hellman, but I call Diffie-Hellman Merkle public key distribution, which was the, uh, key, the important, well, the, the the, the, um, one of the main results of new direction, in New Directions. I was playing around one night with the discrete exponential function, y equal alpha to the x mod q. But now we have a whole bunch of users, so each user has a secret key and a public key. And so I said, let's see, yi equal alpha to the xi mod q, that's the function. And in a minute, you'll see how I came up with the idea to let kij, the key that users I and J use. So I would use a different key with Carl from with Howard, because I'd use Howard's public key and my secret key to get our mutual key. I'd use Carl's public key and my secret key. What would Howard do? He'd use my public key and his secret key. It turns out it doesn't matter who does it first, whether you take yi to the xj or yj to the xi. It doesn't matter whose public key and whose secret key you use. You get the same result because the result is alpha to the xi xj. It's commutative. It doesn't, the, the multiplication in the exponent doesn't matter which way you go first. Alpha to the xj xi is the same as alpha to the xi times xj. The interesting thing is I was trying to find a public key crypto system, because by this time, Witt and I had the concept, but we didn't have an implementation. Uh, and yet what I came up with when I did this was a public key distribution system, a Merkle system. Uh, so how did I do it? Late one night in May 1976, probably after midnight, I was sitting at my desk, and I wrote down the one-way function, 
And I said, let alpha and Q be public. Now, that's important because there are many variations. I mean, as I show it to you here, you can see why this is kind of a trapdoor derivation. I already knew that alpha, I know now that alpha and Q should be public. But it, that was just one of many variations I tried that night. Computing Y from X is easy. Computing X from Y is hard. So I tried letting XI be user I's secret key and YI being his public key. Then what? Well, eventually, I tried yi to the xj equal yj to the xi, which is alpha to the xi xj, which I call kij mod q. And voila, I had it. By the way, I had an HP 45 calculator. I didn't trust my paper and pencil, so I actually programmed it up and, and, and did a calculation to make sure it worked out. OK, let's shift and go to unsung hero number four, uh, Richard Tropel. When RSA wrote their original MIT report and sent me a draft, um, it, it suggested using 256-bit modulus for n. I wrote back to Ron and said, uh, I think you need to increase the modulus size because Schropel has a factoring algorithm that by the end of the year he expects to factor F8, a 256-bit number. He thought he could factor 256-bit numbers in general. Um, so. Um, they changed the report to recommend at least 200 digits in their famous CACM paper. By the way, the reason our paper appeared in November 76 and the RSA paper appeared only months after they submitted it, I was one of the reviewers for the RSA paper. I get a letter from the editor of the, uh, one of the editors of the CACM, please review this as quickly as possible. This may be the most important paper we ever publish. You rarely get letters like that from editors, very different from the, what Ralph got. Now, how many of you have heard of Schopel before? How many of you have not? Yeah, that's what I thought. How many of you, heard of, how many of you who have not heard of Schopel have heard of Pomerantz's quadratic sieve? Oh, a oh, few. Pomerantz's quadratic sieve, the inspiration for it, in Pomerantz's own words, were Schopel's work. Schopel didn't publish, but he sent, he, had, he, didn't like to, he doesn't like to for some reason, but he did send copies of his paper around to me, Don Knuth. And so you'll see references in Knuth, one of Knuth's volumes to Schopel's work. And he must have sent it to Pomerantz as well. And Pomerantz's quadratic sieve is very similar to, uh, uh, I mean, it's, sorry, it's different, but it's very, has, you'll see a lot of similarity to what Rich was doing. The key thing was that Rich was able to use a sieve to double the size of the numbers that could be factored. Rich also came up with the analysis that showed the e to the square root of two uh, e to the square root of log n log log n behavior that we now apply to Pomerantz's quadratic sieve, Rich was the first to come up with that. Not rigorously, and other people have since made it more rigorous. Another unsung hero, Lauren Kahnfelder. How many of you have heard of him? Okay, oh, one person. Lauren was an undergraduate at MIT doing a bachelor's thesis under Len Adelman's direction. And in his thesis, he proposed uh, digital certificates, the basis of uh, a whole part of a whole, you know, the public key infrastructure and revocation and things like that. Lauren Kahnfelder. So VeriSign should give him a cut. Okay, let me shift gears and let me see where I am on time. Yeah, better move it up. Uh, March 1975, Witt and I were waiting. We knew that the NBS was going to publish a proposed data encryption standard. Finally, March 75, it comes out. One of the things we notice is that it has a 56-bit key size. And we look at the, actually, Witt was the first one to recognize it. He looks and he says, that's not big enough. I mean, that's 100,000 million million keys to order of magnitude. It seems huge to me. But Witt said, no, I think you can do an exhaustive search. I mean, Witt was much more computer literate than I. And, um, Basically, what we eventually came up with is you could search a million keys per second per chip. You buy a million of these chips at $10 each. So that's not too expensive for a place like NSA or their foreign equivalents. That's $10 million. Whoops. I didn't, hope I didn't do something there. Um, now you're searching 10 to the 12th keys per second. How long does it take to search 10 to the 17th keys? Just 10 to the 5th seconds, which is about a day. A day's a little over 80,000 seconds. And so we estimated $10,000 per solution. And worse, with Moore's law, we estimated that the cost would decrease by a factor of 10 every five years for at least the next 10, 20 years, which in fact has happened. And worse, this is the most 
computationally intensive way to break your crypto system? What if there are shortcuts? Well, NBS answered our other uh, objections, but this one they kind of glossed over. And after six months of, try, uh, of naively thinking this was a bug, we realized it was a feature. Um, January 1976, uh, we so this is now about uh, six to nine months after the initial announcement, nine months after the initial announcement, six months after we initially contacted NBS with our comments. Uh, and we, we realized we had a political problem. And if we were going to change the key size, we had to go to Congress and try to get hearings, if we had to go to the uh, media and get coverage, and we prepared to do that. At that time, two high-level NSA employees flew out. They were very friendly, not threatening, but they did tell us because they're trying to get us to quiet down. And they told us that if you continue talking this way, you're going to cause grave harm to national security. Well, I went home to try to figure out the right thing to do that night. My intellect is telling me the right thing to do is go public. The United States is the most computerized nation in the world. The Soviet Union, our main adversary at the time, was the, one of the least computerized. We had a lot more to lose than them. There are a number of other reasons. But here I had two high-level NSA people telling me just the opposite. So while I'm trying to figure out the right thing to do, an idea pops into my head. Forget about what's right and wrong. You never have more, a greater chance to gain notoriety. Run with it. And I liken it to the movies where a devil appears on the actor's shoulder and is whispering in his ear. That was the devil whispering in my ear. At the time, I thought I very uh, correctly brushed that devil off my shoulder and made a logical, rational decision that going forward was the best thing. Now, I was right. Admiral Inman, who was the director of NSA at the time, in an interview several years ago that um, Henry Corrigan Gibbs, a, a PhD student of Dan Bonez, uh, conducted, uh, uh, Henry asked Admiral Inman, with what you now know, would you still try to suppress Hellman's work? And Inman said, quite the opposite. I tried to get it out as quickly as possible because the Chinese theft of uh, uh, defense-related information from the United States has convinced me that the national security uh, uh, importance of the national security importance of strong commercial encryption. So we made the right decision, but I made it for the wrong reasons. Five years later, and I won't go into the details, I'm watching a documentary about the making of the atom bomb, and I realize that I would fooled myself, because I think the people who worked on the bomb fooled themselves in a way that's described I think it's in the CACM paper, it's certainly in the book my wife and I wrote. And I, what I did was, I did what most people do, so I don't fault myself for this. This is a very human behavior. I figured out what I wanted to do, which was go public, and then I came up with the rationalizations for doing it, whether it was the right thing or not. And fortunately, in this case, I made the right decision. But if it had been making a bomb that could destroy civilization, I might have done that too. So I vowed never to do that again. Now. Five years, there's another story, I know it's in the book, it may be in the CACM paper. About five years later, we're in a patent fight with RSA, Stanford, MIT, RSA, and, and, and Silink. And um, RSA sold their company for $250 million, and we made almost no money off our patents, because among other things, they weren't willing to pay us royalties. And the story's in there. Uh, and I was really pissed. And, uh, by the way, Ron's a good friend now. Jim Bidzos, who was the CEO of RSA, is a good friend. Uh, we're, we're past all that. I actually have gone back and, in my own mind, seen how, from their perspective, they could, I don't know for sure, but they could see me as having started the whole fight. Uh, I don't have time to go into that in the talk. So I'm not blaming them for this, but at the time, I was really pissed at them. And um, the CEO of Siling comes to me, and his exact words were, you help me get an exclusive license to Stanford's patents, and we'll get those RSA bastards by the balls. Uh, he spoke that way. He was a little scrappy guy from Philadelphia. Uh, and I wanted to, it seemed like it made good business sense to go with Silink, but I was afraid that I was making, fooling myself again. I went to my wife and explained my conundrum, because I vowed never to do that again. And she came up with a very simple solution. She said, Director of Technology Licensing at Stanford, then was Niels Reimers, has the same business interests that I do, and for Stanford, yes. He doesn't have the emotional investment in this that I did. No, he didn't. Let him make the decision. And he said we should go with Silink. So I can be sure that I didn't fool myself that time. Uh, May 76, we came, oh, so the DES key controversy became even more important 
because in May 76, when we published the Diffie-Hellman Merkel key exchange, all of a sudden people can change keys every day, every minute if they want to, whereas before it was very expensive. They might use keys for years. July 77, um, a man named J.A. Meyer wrote a letter to the IEEE. This is when the whole fight kind of came to a head. Uh, he was an IEEE member. He writes from his home address, which happened to be in Maryland. Uh, Witt later confirmed that he worked at NSA. And he said, as an IEEE member, I'm concerned that the IEEE is breaking the law by publishing certain papers. And he sent a copy of the ITAR, the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, which on the surface may have said that we could not publish our papers in international journals because we were exporting technical information related to an implement of war. Anything cryptographic was deemed to be an implement of war by the ITAR. The IEEE wrote back, it's interesting by the way, when people start talking about cryptography, they start talking in code. He never said, you shouldn't publish Hellman's papers. But he listed like six journal uh, issues that had papers that he felt violated the law. I think I had pa papers in five of the six. The IEEE writes back to him um, that they are well aware of the ITAR, but it's always been their position that they cannot be the gatekeeper. It's up to the authors and their institutions to make sure they're not breaking the law. Now, in code, they also sent a copy to me. But they didn't send it to me as Martin Hellman, author of the problematic papers. They sent it to me because I was on the board of governors of the IEEE information theory group that was publishing most of these papers. But they didn't send it to all the governors. <laughs> so I took the letter to, um, I took the letter to um, John Schwartz, who was then Stanford's general counsel. Um, because Stanford was potentially liable. And also, from a personal point of view, if I was prosecuted, I wanted to make sure I had Stanford's financial backing, because defending yourself can bankrupt you. In fact, you might not even have enough money. Probably, I didn't have enough money to defend myself. Uh, so I had a good meeting with um, John. And he said, um, after studying it, he said, it's his legal opinion that if the ITAR are construed broadly enough to cover my papers, then they were, it was unconstitutional because freedom of speech, freedom of the press. But he also told me, and his letter, his memo in which he put this down is uh, on the Stanford Library archives. You can find it there, or uh, I, I can point you to it. I have had them scan all this stuff. Um, he wrote, but there's at least one other, one different legal opinion, that of J.A. Meyer. And this can only be settled in a court of law. If I was prosecuted, they would defend me. If I was convicted, they'd appeal. But then he warned me. By the way, if you're, all appeals are exhausted, we can't go to jail for you. <laughs> but with Stanford's financial backing, I felt comfortable. Uh, he also recommended uh, that two students, Steve Pollack, who you saw, and Ralph Merkel, who I've, uh, you've also seen, who were slated to give papers, joint papers, that we had at the Octo in October at the IEEE in International Symposium on Information Theory at Cornell University. He recommended that I give the papers instead of the students. I had originally planned for the students to give the papers because there was a question of whether the university could defend a student. So be careful, you guys. <laughs> but I was an agent of the university. I was bringing contract uh, grant money into the university. They could clearly defend me. But even more importantly, he pointed out that a new PhD might have trouble getting a job if he had a multi-year court case hanging over his head. Whereas I was a tenured um, associate or full professor at that time, so I could, my career was different. So I went to Ralph and Steve, and I said, told them, you know, I feel comfortable giving the papers with Stanford's backing, but whatever you want to do is fine with me. The two students both said, nope, we'll give the papers. Until a week later, they come back and said, our parents are beating on us. <laughs> and actually, my mother had called me, too, and said, what the hell are you doing, you know, taking on NSA? Uh, and so they said, uh, reluctantly, um, uh, we'll let you give the paper. But what I did was, when it was time for these two papers, one after the other, uh, I went up with the student, and everybody knew about this legal um, brouhaha. And I said, on the advice of Stanford's counsel, I will be giving the paper instead of the student, but the student deserves credit as first author. I want you to consider the words that I'm saying as if they're coming from the student, except legally. And of course, the, <laughs> Students got more, more credit and more attention this way than they ever would have if there hadn't been this going on. Did you run that, what? Did you run that method past 
<laughs> no. <laughs> okay, the revolution, resolution begins. 1978, so the year after the Cornell um, mess, I get a call from uh, the director's office at NSA. Admiral Inman, who was then the director, is going to be on the West Coast. He, if you're up to it, he'd like to visit with you. And we'd been fighting this all out in the press, never really talking directly. Meyer wrote his letter to the IEEE from his home address. I said, great, I'd love to talk. And so Inman came to my office a couple of weeks later. It was over in the Duran building on the first floor uh, where they were doing uh, renovation. Or they may still be doing it. And his first words practically were, he looked at me and he said, it's nice to see you don't have horns. That's how I was being depicted within the agency. And actually, even after we re resolved this, there were still people writing things that have since come out that were secret now declassified, where they're calling me all kinds of names. Uh, I wrote to Inman about it and said, could you do anything about this? But they really can't. Uh, I looked back at Inman and said, same here. Because I had seen NSA, actually, I pictured them as Darth Vader. And I was younger then. I was you know, roughly 30 instead of uh, 72. And I, uh, so I could see myself as Luke Skywalker to their Darth Vader. He also said, I'm meeting with you against the advice of all the other senior people at the agency, but I don't see the harm in talking. Inman is an out of the box kind of guy. You'll see this from him in general. I don't, we don't agree on everything, but we found a lot that we agree on. And that was initially a cautious relationship. But over time, it grew actually into a friendship. And I had lunch with him in, when I was in Austin a couple of years ago. And as a good example that it's better to have friends than enemies, I mean, we all know that. But how many of us tried to turn enemies into friends the way Inman did? And it's really nice that Inman was the one who initiated this rather than me. I give him the credit for starting this. Now I try to do that. But back then, it was him. About eight years ago, I realized that one of the key missing ingredients in nuclear deterrence was knowing how risky it was. I mean, if we could expect nuclear deterrence to work for 100 million years before it failed, that's comparable to an extinction-level asteroid hitting the Earth. The fact that we're making slow progress is probably OK. But if the expected time until nuclear deterrence fails and we destroy civilization is more like 100 years, which in my own research indicates it probably is, that's 1% a year, 10% a decade. Uh, the younger people in the audience, not uh, the people like me, have probably worse than 50-50 odds of living out their lives without there being a major nuclear war. That's horrendous. Well, I wanted people with national security backgrounds to sign a statement of support, because I'm an electrical engineer, not a former director of NSA. Inman signed the statement of support. Now, he wouldn't have signed it if he didn't agree, but he also wouldn't have signed it if he didn't trust me, if we were enemies rather than friends. So it's better to have friends than enemies, and yet how often do we have enemies that we don't think about how to try to turn them into friends? I don't see the harm in talking. My wife and I summarize this in our book as get curious, not furious. That's how we turned a marriage, which started out great 50, almost 51 years ago, uh, to the point where we were practically headed, in fact, probably headed for divorce 10 years later to where, back where it is now, where we haven't had a, an argument in over 15 years. Uh, I mean, we disagree, but we see it as Oh, why do you think that? That's different for me. And, and there's even a story in the book, the new car story, which I won't go into here. Resolution grows. That started in 78. 1993, Congress requests the National uh, Research Council, the research arm of the National Academies, to do a study of national cryptographic policy, particularly export uh, restrictions on uh, cryptographic um, devices. Uh, that was a big piece of it. And the report's called the Crisis Report, Cryptography's Role in Securing the Information Society. It's freely available as a PDF on the NRC or National Academy uh, website. All constituencies were represented. I represented the privacy interests. We had a former direct, uh, uh, Attorney General, Benjamin Civiletti, representing law enforcement, the FBI. We had Ann Cara Christie, who was a uh, former Deputy Director of the NSA, representing their interests. And we put aside our prejudices. Uh, I worked really hard at doing this, and they did too. And we were able to reach unanimous conclusions. We compromised a bit. We said, what's possible? And these were some of our major conclusions. Relaxation of, whoops, export restrictions should be relaxed considerably. In particular, DES should be almost freely exportable, with a few exceptions like North Korea. 
And within a year or two, that came to be. Now, we can't say for sure that our report caused it, but we think it played a role. Another um, conclusion that was in our report that some people have told me may have been the most important conclusion is that the classified information was largely irrelevant. I had studiously avoided taking intelligence clearances up to this point because then NSA would might be able to control what I published. But I was getting ready to retire, and I wasn't, didn't anticipate doing research in this area. So I went and took a lie detector test and all that stuff and got my uh, intelligence clearance. And most of the committee was cleared. We did have some unclassified briefings, because uh, not everybody was cleared. And uh, in those unclassified briefings, several times people said what I'm sure you've heard. If you knew what I knew, you'd think differently. Well, what we concluded is no. I mean, the classified information was somewhat useful, but it didn't really change our overall perspective. In fact, I remember saying, look, the terrorists have tried to blow up the World Trade Center once. They're going to try again. They're likely to try again. We should be watching for that. I, this was before September 11th, obviously. And so you don't need an intelligence clearance to be able to see the, imp the really important things. We also, oh, key escrow was a big piece of the puzzle at that time, too, because it's now called exceptional access. And I, I identify three crypto wars. The first crypto war was largely over freedom to publish DES key size, things like that. And Henry Corrigan Gibbs article covers that beautifully, uh, which you can find. Um, it's on the, in the Stanford Alumni Magazine, freely available online. The second crypto war was largely over uh, key escrow, which is today very similar to exceptional access. And our committee spent a, wasted a lot of time trying to figure out how to do key escrow, because just like today, the government had not put forward the law enforcement, and in that case, also national security interests, had not put forward a complete plan. It was just a vague idea that we should do key escrow without saying how you'd handle it internationally and a bunch of other things. And at some point, our committee decided we're spending too much time on this trying to figure out how it would work. Let them figure out how it would work and come back to us. And that's what we suggested in the report. They never came back. And I believe that this third crypto war is really the second crypto war revisited. And you can see that several former directors of NSA have said that the FBI is wrong to want this exceptional access. It's really the FBI that's fighting the third crypto war. Um, and so I think we need to go back and look at the lessons we learned in the 90s. Well, in summary, this talk has been about the evolution of public key cryptography, but it also shows personal evolution. I'm not the same person today that I was when I pictured NSA as, Dar as Darth Vader, when it took Admiral Inman to start the reconciliation process. Today, I try to do those things. And I think this is really key, not only to leading a better life, but to survival of the human species. Because unless we learn to get curious instead of furious, we're going to keep getting into wars. We may get into war with North Korea. And by the way, the situation with North Korea is very different from what most people think. Their record, their track record of adherence to the major nuclear agreement we had with them, known as the 1994 Agreed Framework, is actually surprisingly good. They stopped building two large reactors under that agreement. We was, they were supposed to get replacement reactors that were more proliferation resistant from us. They never got them. And they couldn't finish the, the partially completed ones because they'd rusted so badly. So they actually feel suckered by us. And so Tillerson's right that North Korea has a bad track record in some ways, and it needs to earn a place at the negotiating table. What he leaves out is the US also needs to earn a place at the negotiating table. So there's a lot more involved here than just cryptography or uh, learning to live with your uh, spouse or significant other or your coworkers. And so I'd summarize by concluding. Get curious, not furious, and really work hard at turning enemies into friends. In fact, not seeing people as enemies. Life works a lot better. Thank you. OK, so do we have, to, we have time for, how do we do the uh, questions? Just I'll take stay them? Stay here until they have more work. What? <laughs> OK. Um, and identify yourself, please. Uh, my name's John Wharton. Okay, hey, John. I used to be affiliated with this class decades ago. Uh, this is a little bit off topic. You mentioned that before giving this paper, you and the two students all had concerns expressed by your respective parents. How is it that your parents 
came to know that there was something happening that you might be in trouble for. Oh, well, in my case... Uh, were they uh, visited by men in black? For <laughs> no. In, in my case, um, we got David Kahn to write... Whit and I got David Kahn, who we knew, to write an op-ed in the New York Times about the key size. And, it, it, and there, there was a lot of coverage. I mean, I had reporters in my office. I could have spent... Uh, uh, my full work week just talking to reporters and, 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 and film crews, although I didn't. And so there was a lot of news surrounding this. I mean, the picture I showed you of Ralph, Witt, and me, that was in Time magazine. So my mother couldn't help but know that it was going on. And the case of uh, uh, Steve and uh, Ralph, I don't know for sure, but I suspect you know they, they were talking on a regular basis, and, and they didn't hide it from them. Another question. Let's see. We'll take one on this side of the room. Anybody? Yes, Carl. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture and all the great work that you've done in this area, particularly in the early crypto wars. But I'm afraid that we're well into the third crypto war. And they're very confident now that they can make highly secure backdoor system. And there are even proposals running around, like the one that I published in the SSRM. And uh, so I don't know what we're going to do, but it seems to me that public awareness is one of our best defenses. Because now that we're going to all, all be wearing uh, public glasses in 10 years, it's going to be we see and hear everything you see, hear, and say, and we don't want that. Yeah, well, public awareness is the key on all these things. I just attended a uh, talk with uh, a meeting with Ted Koppel. Uh, he has a book out, Lights Out, which is about yes. uh, the potential of a cyber attack on the electric grid that could fry transformers, potentially, and uh, put the US into a year-long blackout with horrible consequences. Now, that is an extreme view, but it, it, we don't know if it's possible or not. I mean, look what happened just in January. Um, Paul Kotcher and several other people uh, made public their, their attacks on the, on the Intel uh, chip that had been there for years that no one knew about. And this is one of the things that concerns, it concerns me, although I, have to, I consult Dan Bona, Paul Koch, or people like that, because they're much more current. And they, they agree that when you build in um, any kind of exceptional access, you build in all kinds of new possible wormholes that you couldn't possibly envision. So it, it's, it, it, there's a danger in doing it. Now, there's a trade-off. Um, one other thing I would, I've said, and this was true back in the 90s, um, the FBI keeps saying they want to go back to the good old days when they got a warrant, they could put a pin in the wire and tap and hear what was being said. Well, in the, in the good old days, they didn't have cell phones telling them where everybody was. They didn't have uh, the internet where, with lots of unencrypted uh, traffic. They didn't have license plate, automated license plate readers. They didn't have security cameras all over the place, many of them private. And when there's a crime, very often they can go to the owner of the store and say, could I have your security tape? And they'll usually say yes. So roughly speaking, let's assume that law enforcement gets 100 times as much raw information as they got before. Even if half of it was encrypted, which I doubt, they'd still be getting 50 times as much informa useful information as they got in the good old days. And so. I sympathize with them. I mean, when there is a criminal act or a potential terrorist act where they can't get into a phone, they can't get into a communication, I wish they could. But we have to look at the trade-off involved. Uh, yes? So I, I really liked your talk. And I congratulate you. Oh, I should say who I am. My name's Mark Cummings, and I'm the CTO of Orchestral Networks. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm really impressed by the transition you've made to to think about how to prevent nuclear war. The, the problem I see now is that um, information warfare, crypto warfare, can actually lead to. Yes. So you've hit it. It's somewhat ironic that I left cybersecurity to work on nuclear security, which is intimately related to war and peace, because the reason North Korea has nuclear weapons is because they feel so threatened by us. And the reason they want ICBMs that can reach our homeland is to deter us. Because as long as it's over there, we, we as a nation don't seem that concerned that Seoul would be devastated in a second Korean war. So they, but, but, but it's ironic that cyber warfare may, in the not so distant future, rival uh, nuclear warfare in its, um, in, in its consequences. But even if it doesn't do that, it can be the uh, catalyst exactly. that, that leads to it. So absolutely. And so sometimes I say it's not just in the nuclear. When I talk about 
I have a paper called Rethinking National Security, which is also on um, uh, that my publications page. It's a draft paper. And it starts off with the observation that in 1945, the American homeland could not be touched. Today, 73 years later, trillions of dollars later, we can be destroyed in under an hour. Seems like something went wrong. In mathematics, we have an expression for this. When, you, when a logical line of reasoning produces an absurd conclusion, we call it a reductio ad absurdum, reduction to the absurd, and it's surefire proof that at least one assumption was false. Now here there may be other explanations, but it also says we ought to look at the assumptions. And I start with the very first assumption that national security in the nuclear age, in the cyber age, in the age of bioweapons, chemical weapons, nuclear secu uh, national security may be coming obsolete as a concept separate from global security, yet we still operate as if the way we get national security is to have more weapons than anybody else and threaten them more. I actually argue in that same paper that maybe we should treat not every nation with the respect it would deserve as if it already had nuclear weapons so that we don't encourage them to build them to get that respect. Please. So in the 1500s, 1600s, and early 1700s, European powers actually created and allowed to be created pirate groups. The idea was your pirates would attack your enemy. Privateers. Yeah, the privateers. And what we're seeing now is privateer. Oh, privateer cyber warfare. Exactly. Yeah, how, and, uh, Putin saying, way, I, how could I, I, it just may have been some patriotic people that I couldn't stop. And the way, and the, and the way we ended pirate, the piracy is not completely over, but the way we made it kind of a small footnote instead of. Right, the way we reduced this to the severity of piracy was how. Was, all the nations got together finally and they said, hey, look, you know, if we all support piracy, we're all getting damaged. The damage to us all is greater than if we just agreed not to do this anymore, we'd, we'd all be better off. Right. So if, if we need to look at the experiment. If we, we as a nation were to look at the experimental data, when was the last war we had with a good outcome? <laughs> World War II, if you can call that a good outcome. And even World War II <coughs> may have been avoidable. Someone asked me this question many years ago. They said, how could we have stopped World War II nonviolently? You can't stop Hitler without violence, because I was arguing for resolving conflicts uh, uh, without violence, either physical or uh, uh, verbal. And so I went back and thought about it. If we'd started in 1919 at the Treaty of Versailles, we might well have stopped Hitler. He might ne never have come to power. But it was that ego that, uh, and was in the part of Britain and France more than the United States. But we should have stood up to that. And uh, if we look at the experimental data, just like with piracy, it wasn't working well. Um, Iraq has not worked out well. Our national security has been hurt by it. ISIS had no territory in Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Two thirds, actually this was maybe five years ago, there was an article that two thirds of the Christian population of Iraq who survived reasonably well under Saddam Hussein has had to emigrate out of fear for their lives. Um, the people of Iraq are worse off, our national security is worse off, and yet we then went under a democratic administration, so it's a bipartisan problem, and attacked Libya. Now, we didn't have troops on the ground, but we created the conditions that led to chaos and the murder of Gaddafi. And the, one of the ironic things is this last presidential election was so close that Hillary might have won if it hadn't been for one or another of those various um, uh, uh, press problems that she had. One of them was Benghazi. Then God, now I, I see that as, I, I think that's totally uh, ginned up uh, as, as an anti-Hillary thing, but some pe it, it moved some people over away from Hillary. Benghazi never would have happened if Gaddafi was in charge. And ironically, Hillary was the member of the Obama administration who argued most vociferously for attacking Libya. And why, now taking it up to the current, regime change didn't work well in Iraq, it didn't work well in Libya, and what makes us think it's going to work better in Syria? And yet we're saying Assad has to go. Now maybe there's something I haven't heard, but I haven't heard anything that says it's going to be different. Yes, and it, your name? Is there something about the Clipper chip? The Clipper chip. I was peripherally involved. Okay, so the Clipper chip was the uh, the main one of the main as key escrow te uh, techniques of the '90s. Uh, it was a custom chip that NSA. It had a proprietary. If I remember, it had a proprietary NSA algorithm that was hidden. It was, it was on there, it couldn't be reverse engineered, uh, but it also had 
every time a message went out, the key that was being used for that uh, conversation was encrypted under a chip-specific key and appeared in the header. So if law enforcement or national security could obtain the master key, hopefully legally through a warrant, then they could get to that conversation. Um, but the whole, the, one, of the, one of the big problems we saw with key escrow in, the, in our committee, our National Research Council committee, was what happens internationally. If it's all US communications, fine. But what if it's a French person talking to an American person? Who holds the master key? And uh, there are just a number of problems there. Do you have any comments on Clipper Chip? No, it was just a mess, politically and <laughs> yeah. every other way. And I'm glad I didn't actually have to. Yeah, it sounded good. And actually, I thought about it at, at the time. Remember, DES was not exportable to almost anywhere. It was only a year or two later that it was. And I remember thinking, well, which would I rather have be true? That nobody has strong encryption, or we have strong encryption, but it could be read by the government. I'd clearly rather have the latter than the former. So it was a step forward in a way, but there was an even better step, which was to make DES relatively exportable. And it's kind of ironic that DES today is considered is insecure. I mean, but it's still a big step forward. The, the, at the time of our committee, 40-bit keys were what were exportable, not 56 bits, and that's a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering what you feel about current large-scale private key infrastructures uh, related to cryptocurrency. Do you think cryptocurrency as a model seems secure? Does it seem like uh, something that will stand up over time? Let me ask Andy. What time does this end? It, it ends officially at 5.30. Oh, it ends at 5.30. But so what, there's nobody here after us. So no, I know there's nobody here, but let me just take a short break. I'll take the question. At the end at 5.45. Oh, 5.45? Yeah. OK. Anyone who needs to do it, don't worry. We won't be upset. And at 5.45, we'll actually break and continue. But, but we so, have the room until tomorrow. What? <laughs> we have the room until tomorrow. <laughs> room. OK, I don't. I won't last until tomorrow. Uh, cryptocurrencies. I don't own any cryptocurrencies. I would be very loath to invest in them. But it's probably because I haven't studied them enough. Now, people like Mark Andreessen, who are very clever, have invested in these things. Uh, the, the short answer is, I really don't know. Does anybody here know anything about cryptocurrencies? <laughs> and so, I mean, the other thing is, I look at the that Mount Gox, was it? Sure. And I mean, so even if the even that's if that's somebody not securing their yes, case, but still yes, but still, how do you how do you, how do you work it? And I mean, the other big problem is, uh, from what I've heard, is people who are technically clever can handle the keys and all that. But I, how is it ever going to become generally used? Hard hardware. Hard. Oh, there'll be hardware. So, so there there is hardware. Hmm? Um, so yeah, either on the mobile level or on individual devices with their own firmware. I see. So we have those devices. So it, it, it okay. The, yeah, those devices aren't, they're not exactly foolproof, but. Yeah. Well, that would be, good. that's There's what's needed. Stuff. The reason SS. And they're by yours instead of mine, which are known to be, dis are known to be the compromise. Am I the official stamp? Well, okay. Let's move on. And also, any, any students who have questions first, let me just take that. Any students yeah. who actually showed up at the live seminar <laughs> on the video? No questions? Okay, then we'll go back there. Um, uh, in a sort of a similar follow up, it seems like in, a, in an attempt to like, add features to these cryptocurrencies, a lot of uh, experimental photography is getting included in them. Uh, it seems like a bad thing. At the same time, it's getting tested on in a very public way. Uh, do you feel like that's, that's a good thing for like the cryptography world in general? Or this was for cryptocurrencies? You yeah, said? people are like, introducing new I really don't know enough about it to, to comment intelligently. Back of the room. So you mentioned that... Speak up loudly. That you mentioned that, that uh, I guess, key escrow hasn't been sort of well fleshed out in terms of sort of actual, actionable proposals. That right. Um, do you consider something like, uh, like iCloud where, you know, I give my private key to Apple. Tim Cook keeps it on U.S. servers for U.S. citizens, and Chinese servers for Chinese citizens, et cetera. Uh, do, you, do you see that as a form of key escrow and sort of where it's going? Because it seems to me that it matches up pretty well, you know, except well, that instead of the government holding the key, it's right. Apple. But one of the things or, we recognized in our committee 20, over 20 years ago uh, was that there was a lot of key escrow going on. Companies would often escrow keys because if you encrypted your hard drive with a key and you died or you left the company and didn't, you were mad at the company, they would want to gain access. So companies instituting key escrow for themselves were one thing. 
having the government do it for everyone seemed to be something else. Um, the other, this is one other thing that relates here. We, what we saw was that mandated key escrow, where there was going to be a, created a, took something that was cheap and easy to do, which is encrypt, and made it hard and expensive. Uh, like, if you become the key escrow authority, are you liable if you divulge my key, either advert, you know, either um, in intentionally or otherwise? Who's got, how much insurance are you going to have to buy? And who's going to pay for that? So it took something that was cheap and made it expensive. Now, if a company wants to do key escrow for itself, and if people are willing to trust Apple, that's one thing. Maybe there should be uh, more disclosure so people know that's what's going on. And the government track record on keeping stuff secret is oh, not like The good. government track record on keeping secrets is not so good with you thinking of the uh, uh, Office of Personnel uh, Management or what it was called yeah. with all the... Well, and, and their, their malware. Oh, and then NSA malware getting out. Yeah, yeah. And how but, do you prove I gave the key, not somebody else? That's true. Actually, I want to come back to NSA malware getting out. One of the problems with cyber warfare and cyber weapons is unlike nuclear weapons, where just knowing that they're possible doesn't tell you how to make them, with Stuxnet, once we used it, we or the Israelis or both used it on Iran, they could take it apart. And there's evidence that they then used it again, ver versions of that against Aramco uh, and, and, and uh, caused horrible damage. And we need to, the other, oh, the other thing with Russian meddling in American elections, we never talk about America meddling in Russian elections. The Russians are convinced that we threw the 1996 re-election of Yeltsin to Yeltsin. Uh, and it, what is known for sure is that American political consultants were helping Yeltsin's campaign. Uh, and the, another thing, it's a little bit suspicious, and actually I have more than suspicion, I have evidence, that the US Congress vote on additional sanctions on Iran was delayed until after Rouhani was elected, the moderate, the more moderate. Because if we put those sanctions in before the election, it would have given extra. Uh, so we meddle in elections all the time. Oh, and on the grid, we're worried about other people attacking our grid. There was an article in the New York Times, which doesn't make it true, but it's, it, it lends some credence to it, that, that I came across when I was getting ready to go to Ted Koppel's uh, meeting, and this was during the Obama administration, that it, it said that America had uh, cyber weapons ready to attack the Iranian electric grid if we couldn't get them to agree to the agreement that was, that was reached and that Trump is now trying to kill. I saw a student with a question. Yeah, so you, you worked on like all these really, really important problems with leaky crypto and now nuclear deterrence. How do you, what's your like procedure for deciding what problems are important and how, what problems to work on? Ah, good question. So how do I decide, how do I end up working on all these important problems? Uh, I'm a world-class fool. I, uh, there's my lecture, there's a lecture online on YouTube, Stanford Engineering School Hero Lectures. So if you Google Stanford Engineering Hero Hellman, you'll probably find it. It was on the wisdom of foolishness. And so I'll tell you a little story here. About 25, maybe 30 years ago, my wife was doing tarot cards. And I went to her, and I said, why are you doing tarot? I mean, we don't believe in that kind of crap. And uh, but I, I, I wasn't fully curious, but I was a little curious. I, I didn't get mad at her, which, was, which I might have done 10 years earlier. And she said, well, I was afraid of tarot, which you pick up in our culture, because the church made tarot and anything mystical that was out of the church uh, evil of the devil. And she said, I was afraid of tarot, and I decided if I was going to be afraid of it, I should know what it is. I mean, she's amazing this way. And so she said, would you like me to do your tarot reading? So she wasn't putting a lot of stock in it, but she thought it was interesting. So she does the cards, and I end up being the fool. <laughs> and my first reaction is, I'm no fool. I'm a Stanford professor. Look what I've done. I've done this award. No, 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 I'm not a fool. And, but then she pointed out the positive qualities of the fool. He goes where no one else goes. In the fool card, he has one foot on the, on, on the ground and one foot off, and he's blindfolded going off a cliff. Uh, but apparently he's going to be okay. He's got a little dog following him very cheerfully. And in that moment, I realized, it came to me that I had done the work I had done because I was willing to appear foolish. And so watch that, that lecture if you want to see the long version of it, the, the Wisdom of Foolishness. And I have quotes from half a dozen. I could, have, I could have made two dozen colleagues who have won major awards who also were seen as foolish. Vince Cerf is one you all recognize. Uh, he said that even after the success of the ARPANET, 
people thought packet switching was crazy for voice, much less video. And of course, that's how we get Netflix today. Uh, yeah? Uh, what do you think of the progress being made on quantum computers? What do I think of the progress being made on quantum computers? Well, I always have to ask my friends who know something about quantum computing. And I haven't asked recently, but several years ago, when I asked someone in probably in the Ginston lab or whatever they call it these days, uh, um, he said that uh, we won't know for at least 10 years if quantum computing is a realistic threat to public key cryptography with like 1,000, 2,000 bit modulus, because they'd have to build at least 1,000 or 2,000 qubit uh, quantum computers. And he said, if it becomes a potential threat, let's say 10 years from now, we'll probably have at least 10 years before it actually is implemented. But I've given talks uh, in which I point out that there's another threat to public key cryptography, and that's a major advance in factoring. Um, there were major advances in factoring in 1970. Morris and Brillhart's continued fraction uh, method uh, factored F7, the seventh Fermat number, 128 bits long. That was a major advance. Uh, then Schroepel or Pomerantz's sieving, roughly 10 years later, could do 256 bit numbers. In fact, it doubled the size of the numbers. It changed it from e to the square, e to the square root of 2 log n log log n to e to the square root of log n log log n. And the log log n is not that important, so it was the 2 that went away. It roughly doubled the size of the numbers you could factor. 1990, roughly 10 years later, we get up the number field sieve, which not only, it doesn't just cut a factor of 2 in the exponent, it changes it to e to the cubed root of log n log log n. That's really dangerous, because now another major advance that cut that to e to the cubed root of log n over 2 or something like that could blow the size of the numbers that we need up to 10,000 bits or something unusable. Now, most people tend to look at it and say, look, we haven't had a major advance in factoring in almost 30 years, since roughly 1990. Uh, it looks like factoring's hit a brick wall. But I look at it differently, and my work on nuclear uh, risk analysis of nuclear deterrence comes in here. Many people have said, look, 73 years without a world war, don't worry. But I look at it and say, if you have a coin of unknown bias that you toss 73 times and get 73 tails in a row, meaning no nuclear war, how confident can you be of not getting ahead in the next 100 years, which is roughly the life expectancy of a child born today, 90 years, let's call it. Not very confident. And in fact, if you want a 95% confidence in your prediction, you can only predict a third of 73 years, so whatever that is, uh, less than 20, 24 years into the future. If you want to be 50% confident, you could predict roughly 73 years into the future. In the same way, I look at each decade as a heads if there's a major advance in factoring and a tails if there isn't. Roughly speaking, and going, assuming no major advance in factoring occurs by 2020, we've seen heads, heads, heads. That was continued fraction, sieving, and number field sieve. Tails, tails, probably tails. If you saw a coin tossed six times that showed heads, 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 tails, 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 would you say heads is not likely to occur ever again? No. Now, that's an imperfect model, but it does indicate that, you shouldn't, that we shouldn't have a lot of confidence. So I think we need to also worry about advances in factoring. And so post-quantum public key cryptography or post-quantum cryptography and post-next advanced <coughs> cryptography might very well be very similar. And I made some proposals like using, and again, I'm not as current as other people, but knowing what I know from 20, 30 years ago, we might use key distribution centers, which are not as good as public key cryptography, but they can distribute keys for privacy along with public key cryptography, and then you XOR the two keys together. If either method stays secure, you're secure. And so put this in place now before there's a major advance in factoring, because this could ha that could happen overnight and you suddenly find our whole digital economy coming to a standstill. For signatures, uh, Ralph Merkel's tree signature method combined with one of the digital signature algorithm methods, so you sign a message twice. If either method's secure, then you're, at least one signature is doing. Uh, five, it's 5.45, so let's break where people can leave. Yeah, we'll stick around for another 10 minutes.